Was that intro music? I don't know if I've ever gotten intro music before. Hey, thank you all so much for being here. These lights really are insane. Thank you. Seriously, thank you. It's really great to be with you all again. We look forward to this all year long, and it's, it's great to have you all here. Um, really, really grateful. Let me ask God's blessing on our time as we begin. Our God and Father, we commit this time to you. We commit our whole weekend to you. Uh, Father, we know that there's been a great battle pitched particularly right here about the authority of your word, particularly as it comes to creation. And Father, we confess that we've been bullied, we've been easily ashamed, we've been embarrassed of your clear word, and this has had disastrous effects on this land. And so Father, we ask that you would be so kind to pour out your spirit upon all the talks, and this talk in particular, so that Father, we we would not just have a, a hit of inspiration, but Father, that your word would be driven deep into our hearts, and that it would give us the kind of courage and joy needed for this moment. And so, Father, we ask for it in the mighty name of Jesus. And amen. Amen. I gave Gabe some title for this talk a number of weeks ago. But as everyone knows, speakers don't really know what they're going to talk about until right before they give their talks. So uh, if there's some title in your program, I apologize. That probably would have been a great talk. (laughs) But it's not the one I'm going to give. The title of this talk is The Kindness of Six-Day Creation. The Kindness of Six-Day Creation. I want to talk about the kindness of creationism and the cruelty of theistic evolution and how these tendencies impact society and culture and politics. My basic thesis is that the further Christians and the culture in which Christians inhabit, the further they get away from a clear understanding of God's sovereign, personal creation of all things in six days, just like Genesis 1 says, the further we get away from that, the further we get from the kindness of God. And, therefore, the less kind and the less kind we and our world will be and the more cruel it will become. The kindness of autonomous man, the so-called kindness of autonomous man, man divorced from God's word, is cruel. And the creative sovereignty of God, the absolute exhaustive authority that spoke the worlds into existence and holds them in their existence, that personal exhaustive sovereignty is more gracious than we can ever imagine. The origin of kindness, like all things, is in the creator God and in his creation of all things. You cannot have true kindness apart from the kindness of the Creator. And however you believe this world came to be, that will be the cornerstone of of your paradigm for what kindness actually is. Either we will have the kindness of God found in His Word, and it will be that which drives our culture, which drives our politics, or else we will have the cruelty of man making it up as he goes along, crushing the weak and the innocent, often all in the name of science and freedom and being nice. So I want to begin by talking about the cruelty of theistic evolution. Perhaps one of the most appalling things about 2020 and the so-called COVID pandemic was the collusion of so many major evangelical Christian leaders with Francis Collins the then director of the National Institute for Health, the NIH. Our friend Megan Basham chronicled this complicity in great detail in an article published by the Daily Wire back in February 2022, from which I'm drawing extensively for these comments. For example, she notes that Tim Keller interviewed Francis Collins, then the director of the NIH, in May 2020, 
which included a digression where Keller and Collins agreed that John MacArthur's church reopening represented the, quote, bad and ugly of Christian responses to the virus. In November 2020, Rick Warren hosted a special broadcast with Francis Collins in which they together lamented Christians who questioned the efficacy of masks. Rick Warren said, wearing a mask is the great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself before going on to argue that religious leaders have an obligation to convince their people to accept government narratives and mandates. When Ed Stetzer interviewed Francis Collins in 2021, pastors were again exhorted to exert their authority to get their congregations vaccinated, to wear masks, and to comply with the dominant mainstream narrative. Stetzer's Billy Graham Center formally partnered with the NIH and the CDC to encourage churches to comply with government COVID measures. While Anthony Fauci championed the mainstream dominant narrative in secular news outlets, Francis Collins was using his evangelical testimony to preach so-called science to believers. It later came out that Francis Collins had written Anthony Fauci a number of emails about what was going on, and in particular, sent a particular email to Fauci asking for a quick and devastating published takedown of the Great Barrington Declaration. Some of you may remember that. It was co-authored by our friend Dr. Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford, which was a, it was a worldwide consortium of scientists and virologists raising questions about the dominant uh, narrative that was supported, uh, supported shutdowns and vaccines and masks and so, so on in the Great Barrington Declaration, um, instead argued for the efficacy of herd immunity for most healthy individuals, for reopening businesses and schools, and targeted care for vulnerable populations. Emails have surfaced with Collins and Fauci mocking these ideas. Meanwhile, the Gospel Coalition was also running articles citing Francis Collins as a respected authority. So how did Francis Collins become such an evangelical hero? Well, in 2007, Francis Collins wrote a book called The Language of God. A scientist presents evidence for belief. And apparently most of the evangelical world collectively wet their pants with worldly lust. Finally, one of the high priests of Darwinism has abandoned atheism and come out as an evangelical Christian. And Collins wasn't just any atheist, any scientist, but he was one of the chief architects of the Human Genome Project, mapping and sequencing the base pairs of human DNA. And as the book's description puts it breathlessly, an instant bestseller from Templeton Prize-winning author Francis S. Collins, The Language of God provides the best arguments for the integration of faith and logic since C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. And how did Collins in that book propose to integrate faith and reason and science? Theistic evolution. Plastered on the front of the paperback, I just looked, I looked at it on Amazon a couple days ago, the New York Times book review is quoted as proclaiming, quote, it lets non-church goers consider spiritual questions without feeling awkward. <laughs> That's your problem. <laughs> the book argues at length that Genesis is allegorical, the creation narrative should not be read as a literal historic narrative. Collins likewise dismisses intelligent design and champions theistic evolution or what he prefers to call biologos. Biologos, which became the name of the organization that Collins founded the same year dedicated to, quote, faith and science working hand in hand. What does that mean? Well, according to their website, in addition to other boilerplate creedal affirmations, they say, quote, we believe that God created the universe, the earth, and all life over billions of years. And we believe that the diversity and interrelation of all life 
on earth are best explained by the God-ordained process of evolution with common descent. They continue, thus evolution is not in opposition to God, but a means by which God providentially achieves His purposes. Theistic evolution. The statement of faith ends with this. As you can find this, I looked it up. It's on the BioLogos website. It ends with this, quote, We believe that conversations among Christians about controversial issues of science and faith can and must be conducted with humility, grace, honesty, and compassion as a visible sign of the Spirit's presence in Christ's body, the church. One wonders where the humility, grace, honesty, and compassion were during the COVID lockdowns. When millions of our grandparents were locked away alone in nursing homes. When millions of at-risk individuals could not access ongoing healthcare, cancer screenings, or the simple encouragement of daily work, school, contact with family and friends, or just another human being. Where was that honesty and humility and grace when the Great Barrington Declaration needed a, quote, quick and devastating takedown? But it's even worse. Megan Basham writes, he, Collins, has not only defended experimentation on babies obtained by abortion, he has also directed record level spending toward it. She continues, among the priorities the NIH has funded under Collins, a University of Pittsburgh experiment that involved grafting infant scalps onto lab rats. as well as projects that relied on the harvested organs of aborted full-term babies. Some doctors have even charged Collins with giving money to research that required extracting kidneys, ureters, and bladders from living infants. Turns out, the kind of humility, grace, honesty, and compassion that they're talking about could just as easily describe Nazi doctors experimenting on Jews. Apparently, this is the visible sign of the Spirit's presence they're talking about. A murdered infant's scalp grafted onto a lab rat. Basham continues, under Collins' watch, the NIH launched a new initiative to specifically direct funding to sexual and gender minorities. On the ground, this has translated to awarding millions in grants to experimental transgender research on minors, like giving opposite-sex hormones to children as young as eight and mastectomies to girls as young as 13, Another project awarded eight million in grants, including recruiting teen boys to track their homosexual activities on an app without their parents' consent. One assumes that destroying teenage lives with perverse experiments is just more humility, grace, and compassion. I want to be clear, I know that people are complex. Individual people are capable of sincerely holding massively contradictory views. And I have every reason to believe that Francis Collins, despite all this, since somewhere, somehow sincerely believes that he, what he's done is consistent with his Christian faith. But the point I want to make is not about Collins in particular, although he provides an appalling example. The point I want to make is that your view of creation has enormous collective downstream effects. And I don't mean this again in the first instance for individuals, though it's true there. I mean it primarily for cultures and nations. Individual people really can be very complex and inconsistent, but over time, culture-wide, ideas have consequences. Individual people are not always logically consistent, but generally speaking, cultures over time are. Bad arguments, bad assumptions, bad presuppositions really do result in their logical conclusions downstream unless they are interrupted by God's grace or repentance or both. 
The kindness of autonomous man is cruel. That's what we saw. The kindness of autonomous man, the kindness, so-called kindness of man, making it up, divorced from God's word, is cruel. But the creative sovereignty of God, the absolute exhaustive authority of God speaking the universe into being and holding it in existence is more gracious than we can ever imagine. Many have pointed out that in the modern evangelical church, one of the highest virtues has become being nice, being winsome. But what this is frequently translated into is a veneer of niceness on the outside, but piles of compromise and cruelty on the inside. Megan Basham again even notes this external veneer with Francis Collins, who's known for having a sort of Mr. Rogers demeanor, all while overseeing this hellish research. The thing that people don't often realize is that when we compromise God's Word, we are always opting for cruelty. The Word of God is the kindness of God. The Word of God is the mercy of God. The Word of God is the grace of God. And when we turn away from His Word, we are necessarily turning away from His kindness. We're necessarily embracing cruelty. So when the Bible opens with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, let there be light, we need to read and hear those words as words of supreme kindness. They are words of immediate personal gift, immediate personal grace from the word of the Father. He spoke, and all the good and perfect gifts came into being from the Father, To explain these words then as mere allegories, as mere symbols, mere poetry, is to strike at the kindness of God. The direct personal creation of God is the intentional, thoughtful kindness of God. What kind of God do we serve? What kind of God brought all things into existence? In the the theistic evolutionary model, The God of Genesis apparently ignited some kind of impersonal dynamite. There was some kind of explosion of chaos, matter. And then this God of Genesis apparently worked through the mechanism of mutations and violence and chaos and the slow, suffering extinction of millions and millions of species over billions of years to arrive at the current state of biological life on this planet. Notice that. Theistic evolution is an attempt to baptize bloodshed. Theistic evolution is an attempt to baptize violence suffering, extinction, and death over billions of years. That's the story. They say over billions of years, chaos reigned, survival of the fittest reigned, violence, chaos, bloodshed, death, suffering, crushing, and God was overseeing it all. Of course, people like Francis Collins and others, they want to describe this so-called creation as God's gracious gift of life and beauty also. Go to the BioLogos website, it's all over. Beautiful creation, order of creation, all, all this stuff. But what have they actually done? They have evacuated the actual history of that gift spoken from nothing, directly from the Father, and instead they've renamed the churning, mutating, boiling, maiming, destroying process of evolution. They've renamed that, or attempted to rename that violence, God's beautiful gift of creation. The irony could not be more sharp. Bio-logos literally means life 
word or word of life or life from the word. But they have completely redefined what those words mean. Don't worry, they say. Those billions of years of mutations and violence and death, don't worry. God was orchestrating it all. (laughs) But that doesn't make it better. (laughs) Don't you understand? That makes it far worse. You've redefined life and gift as suffering and death. That doesn't make it better to say that God did it. That's incoherent. But wait, there's more. There's a law of human nature that we really must get fixed in our hearts and minds at all times, but especially in these days. The vaguer God's sovereignty and revelation, the stronger man's impulse to fill the void. The vaguer God's sovereignty and revelation, the stronger man's impulse to fill the void. This is one of those things we call an inescapable concept. It's not whether, but which. If God is not all-powerful and if God does not reveal himself clearly and sufficiently, then the fallen nature of man will always tend to fill the void, just like water leveling out after being displaced. Sinful men always grasp for any power or revelation that seems unclaimed, which is always a first step to attempting to grasp it. Either God is almighty and the creator of all things and reveals himself fully and clearly and sufficiently in the Bible or else men will come along explaining that God took billions of years and so-called natural causes and time and chance and mutations and extinction. And all of it we need to hear as a rebellious attempt to put distance between God and his creation and ultimately between God and his word. Did God really say? Is always the prelude to attempts to usurp God's authority. Questioning God's word is always an attempt to create a job opening. Sinful man naturally wants some of that power, some of that creative authority to shape and remake the world according to its own whims, to fill in the so-called gaps in the authority, gaps in the revelation. This is what I mean then by autonomous man, man apart from the word, man distancing himself from the word, man saying it's not as clear as all that. Sinners want to be their own gods. And if there are gaps in the narrative, if there's gaps in the creation narrative, well then, what's the problem with some gaps in the law of Moses? God didn't tell us everything about creation. Genesis isn't a science textbook, they say, which quickly turns into, well, God didn't tell us everything about politics, you know. God didn't tell us everything about law or how to organize human society. Deuteronomy isn't a civics textbook. And by the way, neither is it a biology textbook or an anatomy textbook. So who's to say when life exactly begins or why we can't experiment on little babies or give puberty blockers to teenagers? You see, it's not very clear exactly what God made or even what God may still be making. If God spent billions of years throwing away other pre-human species, why couldn't he still be in process with us? Why wouldn't he still be, why wouldn't we still be evolving? And if so, why couldn't we experiment on little babies? If God used natural selection and mutations and the violence of stronger species against weaker ones, why couldn't he use hormone therapy and fetal stem cell research? You see? The claims of ambiguity in God's word are calculated to decrease God's authority and clarity and increase the authority of autonomous man. And the so-called kindness of autonomous man is cruel. When God speaks, worlds burst into being. When God speaks, there is beauty 
and glory. When our God speaks, there is life and there is blessing and there is grace. And when we had rebelled and listened to the voice of the serpent, God spoke again and He spoke His own beloved Son into the womb of the Virgin Mary. He spoke His own Word made flesh. And He spoke a new world into existence. Beauty and glory for our ashes and shame. Life and blessing instead of our death and cursing. Listen to this from Titus 3. In Titus 3, it says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. There's all the cruelty. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's the kindness of God. And all of this really does have massive political ramifications. Submission to the authority of God, submission to the authority of His kind Word is submission to this creative Word, this redemptive Word, this blessing Word. So that when authorities submit to that Word and they use their authority and exert their authority under that authority in obedience... They rule in righteousness and true kindness. When a husband submits to God's Word, he leads his wife in blessing and she is glorified and made more lovely. When a magistrate submits to God's Word, he leads his citizens in blessing and their lives become more fruitful. When a minister of the Gospel submits to God's Word, he ministers life and blessing to his congregation. The Declaration of Independence famously says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. You cannot have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness or the kind of limited governments that actually protect those rights unless you have the Creator who has created men endowed unalienably with these rights. You cannot have that freedom apart from that Creator. And the more muddled you are about that Creator and His creation, the more muddled you will be about those rights and about how civil governments actually secure them. Most of you are familiar with the language from the Declaration, including this appeal to the laws of nature and of nature's God. But perhaps we forget that these laws the laws of nature and nature's God, these laws are being appealed to in the context of defending a political revolution. Remember the end of the Declaration of Independence? The the men sign it and and they basically say, we know that we, we pledge our lives and our livelihoods to one another. They declared treason. It is on the basis, it is on the basis of all men having a creator and knowing that all the way down in their bones that men have the courage to throw off tyranny. It's on the basis of the laws of nature and that nature's God that men have the conviction to risk their lives and livelihoods. And you cannot have that kind of courage. You cannot have that kind of conviction. You cannot have that kind of freedom or those kinds of unalienable rights unless God, the Father Almighty, is the maker of heaven and earth in six ordinary days and all very good. The more muddled our doctrine of creation, 
The more muddled our convictions about Genesis 1, the more vague and muddled will be our convictions about our salvation in Jesus Christ, and therefore our convictions about political liberty, our unalienable rights, and what governments are actually for. It all goes together. We have been shown inestimable kindness in this land. And the Declaration of Independence and the ensuing war that was fought for it were some of the greatest acts of kindness in the history of the West. Maybe some of you remember what President Biden said at a campaign stop in Texas while running for president. Yes, in Texas, Gabe. While running for president in 2020, he he said this. He said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men and women created by, you know, you know the thing. (laughs) Which is probably a pretty good summary of American cosmology and etiology. (laughs) Created by, you know, you know the thing. Which is why our politics and government are in the state they are in. You cannot get unalienable rights or a just cause for a just war or limited government and liberty from you know, you know the thing. Instead, all you get from that kind of vagueness is cruelty and tyranny. But Christians in many ways, have led the way in this muddle. I mean, it was a so-called evangelical Christian leading the NIH. It's been considered acceptable for a century or more in many denominations for ministers of the gospel to declare exceptions to their confessional statements on creation. It has been declared non-essential to the gospel, at least functionally. It's been declared non-essential to the gospel to believe that Genesis 1 is describing millions or billions of years, ages of time, or simply some kind of vague symbolic poem about, about God's creative genius. You know, you know, the thing. And so right on schedule, our courage has been diminished our conviction has faded and our freedom has been sold for a coddling nanny state of regulations, taxes, porn, sex change operations, and mindless lockdowns. When the doctrine of creation is considered non-essential, soon your churches, your businesses, and your unalienable rights will also be considered non-essential. But I would be remiss if I simply pointed out there at all of those liberals. We must not merely sit here and point at all of them and think it's all their fault. No, in many fundamentalist homes where six-day creation has been preached it has been preached with a functional Darwinism in spirit. Instead of this doctrine of creation in six days filling Christian homes with overwhelming gratitude and joy and kindness, many have taken this good biblical milk and boiled their kids in it. What do I mean? Well, How many modern angry atheists and LGBT activists grew up in evangelical families, churches, and Christian schools? Too many. And then this happens in so many Christians, too many Christians shrug and say, well, it's just a mystery why some Christian kids fall away. And yes, I do know There are some really hard cases. But how many of them are so angry and rebellious now 
because of the way their fathers and mothers talked to them while they were growing up. How many creationist homes are functionally Darwinian and theistic evolutionary homes? Yeah, the ones that teach six-day creation, the ones that drag their kids to the creation museum and the ark encounter maybe every year who use the Bob Jones curriculum and, and they go over all the fossil data and they watch Riot in the dance and they do all the things. But how many of those homes are full of bitterness? Critical spirits, grudges, and unconfessed sin. And then how many of those same homes cover it all over in a false veneer of niceness. Especially at church. Especially when people come over from church for dinner. Especially when we're out in public at a Christian conference. The kids are watching and they see it. How many Christians try to cover that kind of violence with vague platitudes about how God is at work in it all? God's at work as they snap and bite. Don't you see that's just functional theistic evolution? You can't call your cruelty to your brother or your sister, your son or your daughter, God working and then magically get happy homes, healthy churches, or a truly just society. You cannot have that kind of blessing from God apart from the kindness of God, which is is to say complete submission and surrender and obedience to the Word of God, which includes how you talk to one another. We're talking about the kindness of God, creating the world for nothing, So think about your words. We are made in the image of God, and one of the ways we reflect His glory is in the power of our words. This is the first task given to Adam in the garden to name the animals, whatever he called them. That was their name. From the beginning, man images his maker by having a potency in his Words in his language we name, and like God's words, they are potent, they're powerful, they're magic. As God created the universe through naming, we reflect that power and glory in our words by constantly naming what's going on around us as we talk to one another and about one another. We're, we're naming. We're naming what we did as we tell the story of what we did this morning or what we saw or what happened. We're naming it. This is why James says that the tongue is like the rudder of a great ship turning worlds this way and that. The tongue is a flame thrower. It's able to destroy whole worlds. Proverbs says so much about the power of the tongue. In chapter 12, 18, it says, Some words stab and pierce like a sword with violence, but the tongue of the wise gives good health. Proverbs 15.4 says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse mouth can break hearts. Proverbs 18.21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and we eat the fruit of our own mouths. We're either speaking words of life and then eating life and feeding life to those around us or else we're speaking words of death and poisoning ourselves and those around us. In Proverbs 26.8, it says that lying hates those afflicted by it. And flattery works ruin and destruction. A foolish and loose woman flatters and manipulates and makes her home an awful place to live. But a wise woman opens her mouth with with wisdom and the law of kindness is on her tongue and she builds a house. 
So I want to ask you, what is the dominant tone in your home? What's the tone of your marriage? What's it usually like? Is it sweet? Is it gracious? Is it understanding? Is it patient? Or is it tense? Is it angsty? Is it biting? Is it critical? Is it complaining? What's it like to ride in your family car? You and the kids. What's the tone? What's it like at your dinner table? Is the dominant tone kindness and mercy, joy and laughter, or is it harsh? Is it biting? Is it criticizing? Is it angry? Is it static? Constantly correcting with a veneer of niceness, especially when anyone else is around. The name for that is hypocrisy. The name for that is lying. We got here on Tuesday, Tuesday night late. I guess it was early Wednesday morning, technically. Wednesday morning, I got up outside the Hampton Inn right over here. And and this mother frog marches a young boy out puts him in the corner of the building and just starts yelling. And I, and I just, and I had already prepared all this, as this is what I was going to talk about. I was like, I mean, it's bad enough to lose your temper at your kid. It's bad enough to talk to your son. I mean, I'm sure he looks like an eight to ten year old boy. He needed help, I'm sure. But there you are in the shadow of the ark. There you are in the shadow of God's kindness. Screaming vitriol at your son. That's functional Darwinism. It's functional theistic evolution. You cannot plant harsh words and reap a joyful family. You cannot plant that kind of seed and have that kind of harvest. You cannot plant hatred, bitterness, envy, resentment, and then expect to reap fellowship and righteousness and joy in your home. Darwin says that you can. Theistic evolution says you can. It says you can get order and beauty out of chaos, out of mutation, out of violence, out of billions of years of extinction and murder. Theistic evolution claims that God works that way, but it's a lie. And it's even, and even worse, it's even worse than a lie when you try to decorate it with Bible verses saying that God is at work through all your violent words. No, He is not. Or He may be at work, but He may not be doing what you think He's doing. You cannot bite and devour one another and call that a Christian home. You cannot graft an infant scalp on the back of a rat and call that compassion. No one in this room has spoken perfectly. No one has only ever planted kindness. Everyone has said things they shouldn't have. Everyone has been sharp or critical or thoughtless or complaining at one time or another. So what do we do? The answer is here. The answer is still here. We who are unkind must turn to the one who is kind. We must turn to His Word, turn to His creative Word that not only created all things in the beginning in six days, but is set about to recreate all things by the Word of His power, the Word of His infinite kindness in three days. And so what is that Word? What is that kind word? The word is this. Because of the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
There's nothing so damaging as harsh words, lying words, bitter words, biting words, but there's nothing so healing, so restoring, so kind, and so gracious as the words, I sinned against you, please forgive me. If you've made messes with your words, this is the only way to clean them up. Don't be a functional Darwinist or theistic evolutionist. Don't say, God will take that poison I fed my kids and they'll become healthy. Don't say, I can sweep this secret porn habit under the carpet and it will be okay. Don't say you can take, you can leave that sin there undealt with and you'll get anything that you want in the end. That's theistic evolution. Even if you put Bible verses on it and you say God will, God will work it out, God will do it. No, the promise is, is that God will forgive if you confess your sins. But whoever tries to hide their sin the Bible says he will not prosper. If you have stabbed, if you have harmed one another in your home, this is the only medicine that will bring healing to your home. But this is the thing. It's, it's there. It's right here. Right? It's your stubbornness. It's, it's, your, it's, your, it's your rebellion. It's your hard-heartedness. It's your fear of man. Whatever it is that keeps you from this freedom. That keeps you from this grace. The medicine's there. Don't put hypocritical band-aids on it. Well, I think we were pretty good in church this week. The pastor, you know, he, was, he, was, he smiled at us. Right? No. If there's, if, there's, if there's sin undealt with in your home, the only way out is the blood of Jesus. But, but here's the thing. Here's, here's the good news. The blood of Jesus is there. All you have to do is ask. It's, it's given freely. All you have to do is ask for forgiveness. Ask God for forgiveness and then ask those you've sinned against for forgiveness. Go to those you've wronged. Go to those you've harmed. Ask their forgiveness. Sometimes people try to do it halfway. They say, well, I ask God for forgiveness a lot. I, I just don't know why it doesn't seem to be working. Well, the reason it's not working is you didn't obey Him. Confess it to God, and then what does God say to do? He says, you're forgiven. Go tell who you sinned against. If you're so forgiven. Oh, no, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. Okay, then sit there in your sin. No, if you want to be free, you've got to let the blood of Christ cleanse you entirely. I, I want to particularly, under, this is true for all Christians, this is true for everybody, but I want to particularly highlight this for you men. Husbands and fathers, because of the way God made the world, our words have a particular power. Your words, harsh words, biting words, critical words, lying words, your words do more harm because God's made you of man. Because you're a leader, you're a husband, you're a father. But I want you to hear this, men, by the same token, the man who humbles himself and says, I was wrong, I sinned against you, please forgive me. Those words are also, by the same token, far more powerful than you think. Do not say to yourself, it's too late. Do not talk like a Darwinist. We believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, who made all things in six days and all very good. That same creator God spoke his word into the flesh of the Virgin Mary to go to the cross for you and me. The kindness of God is right there. It's right there. It's on offer to you for your marriage, for your family, for your kids, for your grandkids, for your parents, for your grandparents. It's right there. It's right there. And notice that language. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. He's what? He's faithful and just. 
to forgive us and cleanse us. This is the beginning of true Christian justice. This is the politics of six-day creation. The same God who spoke the light into existence and formed the firmament and made dry ground and filled it with stars and birds and fish and animals and man, the same God who is only light and there's no darkness in Him at all, invites us to walk with Him in the light. It says if we walk with Him in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. How do sinners walk in the light? How can those who have darkness in them walk in the light? With Him who is all light, nothing but light by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. How does the blood get on you? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Christians are not people who don't sin. Christians are people who know what to do about it. Do you hear that? Right? You all have seen the... You've heard me say this before, maybe. I use this analogy often, but... You know, you see the, that, that family in McDonald's? You know that family? And the, everybody's on edge. And there's a two-year-old there and they hand him the root beer and he spills it on the floor, on the ground and the, and the parent, it just blows, they go berserk. How could you do that? And I, I was sort of want to be like, he's three. You know, three-year-olds specialize in spilling. You see, there's this thing we've invented. It's called a mop. I bet they have one here. Right? I mean, in many of those situations, the parents are making far bigger mess than the root beer on the floor. The root beer on the floor will be gone and no one will remember it in half an hour. But those words will last forever. That anger will last forever. That spite will last forever. That impatience will last forever. If... It's not cleansed by the blood of Jesus. But we have the blood. We have the blood. Right? We know what to do about the mess. We know what to do about the sin. We know what to do in our marriage. We know what to do in our family. We know what to do in the church. And if we get it right there, if God will bless us there, by walking in the light there, because we know the one who made us and whose image we bear, who has redeemed us by the blood, if if He will make us right there, He will remake this land. But if we don't get it right there, if, 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 if God turned the keys over to Christians tomorrow, you better believe all we have in front of us is a bunch of Francis Collins. We're not ready for that. We need to be ready. That's what we are, we're praying, God, give us reformation in this land. Give us revival. Stop the car from going off the, I guess it's already gone off the cliff. God, bring it back off the, out of the air, back onto the land. Make the car fly. <laughs> Lord, please. We know that in God's economy, numbers don't matter. They never have. What we lack in this land is I mean, millions of professing Christians, millions of people that go to churches every week professing the gospel, evangelical Christians who have Bibles in their houses. And there's this tiny, tiny fraction of LGBT woke activists who are chasing us. Why? The Bible is utterly clear. Because God is displeased with us. You cannot win if you do not have God's blessing. And so we must determine to ourselves, we must determine within our families, determine in our marriages and in our churches and in our businesses and in our communities that we must have God's blessing. And the only way to God's blessing is through the blood of Jesus Christ. This is the politics of six-day creation. God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, man and woman in his image in six days, and all very good. That is his original blessing, and though we've thrown it away, he in his mercy has sent his only son so that we might come under that blessing again so that nothing can stand before us. We must have that blessing. We must have that God so that we may stand with courage and conviction in our day. God, give it to us. Amen.